So thank you, Miguel, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to see so many people. Um, I'm going to read this lecture, so I, I need to acknowledge Ruth and Erica's support in, in preparing this lecture. I've not done it quite like this before. Most people who know me, I will just look at my slide and speak from my heart more than, more than my head. But I spent a lot of time preparing, and I'm really excited about being able to do this lecture today. And it is being recorded, and it will be on YouTube. So can you all make sure that your phones are on silent, please? So the official title, which I came up with months ago, and I'm slightly deviating from, actually, is Inclusion in Education in the Global South, Dilemmas of Difference. Deliberately vague, uh, I'm actually going to focus quite a lot on disability and deafness, but it was a useful kind of broad framework to get me going. My unofficial title that I, haven't, uh, that I haven't put on the poster is not fully human. This is inspired by a lecture I attended in the 1980s done by a friend of mine, a mentor at the time, Professor Ken Newell, who's dead now. Um, but he was a prominent professor of international community health and he gave a lecture which really stays with me today and it was called Dead Babies. And I remember sitting in the audience thinking, wow, that takes some courage to have a title. And he didn't have another title. Um, I didn't quite have the courage, and it was too late to put Not Fully Human on the poster. Um, it's a theme for me that goes through my learning about disability, uh, north and south. And that's what I'm going to explore to start with. So that it's the, um, the lecture is divided into three parts, roughly 20 minutes each. Um, so I'm going to start with the stories that have shaped my understandings. Then I'm going to think about what I understand by inclusion and what other people think it means. And then I'm going to come to the Global South. So that, that sort of comes at the end. And in a way, it's becoming more and more of an artificial division, I would say. But there are some distinct differences which are important to focus on. So the second acknowledgement, before I really launch into the actual lecture, is to Fafa who has worked really hard with me on my slides. Again, if you've been in my lectures, you'll know my slides aren't very pretty always, but they are very clear and, la and large font. But she's made it much prettier. So thank you, Farfra. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, yes, this is just a reminder to think about this whole theme of not fully human. I picked up this leaflet at an event in, Man in central Manchester a couple of weeks ago and it really shocked me that we have to have leaflets now that say a refugee is a human being. Do we really need to be reminded of that? Um, so so just, just to reinforce this theme that I'm going to speak about, which is not fully human. Um, so the structure I'm using for the lecture is Ben Ockrey's poem. Um, again, if you've been in my lectures, you might have been exposed to this. I've used it a lot. Over the years, ever since I saw Jean Clendenin or heard Jean Clendenin at the Bureau Conference, the British Educational Research Association Conference in Manchester in 2012, present, you know, she's a, she's a well-known narrative analyst and she had this at the beginning of her lecture and I thought, right, it's okay to use that in my lectures. Incidentally, Ben Ockrey's done an amazing poem and very recent one on the Grenfell Tower. Disaster. Um, it's very, very thought-provoking if anybody's interested in Ben Okri's work. So he's a British, sorry, he's a Nigerian-born poet and novelist who lives in Britain, in London. In a fractured age, when cynicism is God, here is a possible heresy. We live by stories, we also live in them. One way or another, we're living the stories planted in us early or along the way. Or we're also living the stories we planted, either knowingly or unknowingly, in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories we live by, he suggests, quite possibly we change our lives and the lives of others I w I'm going to go on to talk about. So I'm going to start with this photograph. Again, those of you who know my work will know that I've done a lot of work with photographs. My, this was taken 63 years ago. My parents declined the opportunity to sit on the front row today. They're so busy <laughs> at 85 and 90 um, and a little bit embarrassed. 
they thought they might embarrass me, so they decided to stay away. So they'll watch the YouTube version. So this is, it, before I launch into the story, because this is where it starts, not at the wedding, a few years later, um, I just want to say that I'm very aware that in, in taking an ethnographic approach, that I'm making my life, not just my work, open to critique. And that's the nature of this kind of work. And it, you know, it's, it's not for everybody, and it is quite exposing. So this is the most personal I've ever got in a lecture, I have to say. I went in search of this photo a few weeks ago, and I remembered the ch these children looking different to how they look when I finally found the photo. Uh, it's my mother and father on their wedding day in 1955. What I found out a few months ago is that my mother had been headhunted at the age of 18 to work with clever, spastic children. These children are spastics, but they're very clever. And they have glasses. Really noticed that when I saw the photo again. They're wearing glasses. My mother's holding that child up because he can't stand up. And the wheelchairs and crutches are out of sight. They're hidden. But what a strong statement to make to the world on your wedding day, actually. You know, I'm kind of blown away by that now that I come back to think about it. My grandfather got his OBE in the 60s from the Queen for his work with disabled people. Now, I didn't question any of that as a child. I just took that all for granted. By chance, I went through primary school with a boy called Robert. He was also referred to by that racialized term Mongol or Mongoloid. I didn't know it was illegal at the time for him to be in my class, as the law considered him to be ineducable or not fully human, we could argue. Now, I'm using these old terms, spastic and Mongol, just to acknowledge that, you know, this is my lifetime and my parents' lifetime, and to highlight the dehumanizing impact of those words. My mother asked me a, a little while ago, she said, what's that new name they've got for disability, sorry, for handicap these days? Because she still uses the word handicap. And I went through disability and impairment and disabled and no, 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 no. And eventually I got to special needs. That's it. That's what handicap's called now. Yeah? It's just a change of language. It doesn't mean the meaning has changed or the, it may represent a, a, a changed understanding, but, you know. It's, it's all in the language. So, I'm going to not leave my parents' wedding, and wedding picture on this screen. I thought, I'd just for those of you who maybe wanted to read over that poem, again, I'm going to leave that there while I tell a little bit more of the story. So, my girls' grammar school was not as inclusive as the primary school I attended. I was studying French, German and Russian. And I considered becoming a spy. It was the 70s. <laughs> but I decided I wanted to become a linguist. However, the careers advisor told me, you can't be a linguist. You're English. Forget it. <laughs> so she was living inside a story that English people can't be linguists. You know? And she passed that on to me. I didn't really believe her. I was still determined. And I've gone on to learn a lot of languages since then. However, I gave up a career as a linguist. So in search of a, a degree that I could st study, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to university, but you know, I thought, well, what else am I going to do? And the, obviously in a girls' grammar school, I was being directed in that way. I found that there was a course in this very building. It was a four-year course for undergraduates to train to teach deaf children. It enabled me to study. I happened to study German and history and audiology and education. We have the only female professor of deaf education on the front row who, who was also trained in those days in Manchester, but on the one-year course. So it's, it's quite a historic building, this, even though <laughs> it might seem a strange one. Um, and so this, this seemed like, yeah, I could do that. You know, why, why don't I train to do I didn't know anything about deaf children. I didn't, I'd never met a deaf person. But what this gave me the opportunity to do was rebel against my father's story, which was, girls don't go to university. Okay? So it's rather lovely that I'm celebrating this story today with you, having celebrated the Athena Swan Gender Equality Charter Mark earlier on today. Incidentally, he was a university lecturer. 
Before going to university, I spent a year... So, so yes, so I was determined. I didn't, wasn't sure whether university was the right place for me, but I was going to go there because my dad said I shouldn't go there. So obviously that was the thing to do. So before going to university, I spent a year in Austria. Now picture this scene, if you can. It's 1976. I'm one of about 20 English volunteers working in a residential home for mostly abandoned disabled children. Schwest, behindert and kinder, they were called, and adults. The Protestant church organisation responsible for the home is struggling to recruit enough staff, even though it's been 30 years since the mass murder of disabled people. Just five individuals who I knew had survived the Nazi raid on the home. Our team is led by a Protestant nun. There's a young man doing his national service, a few Austrian women and me. We're responsible for about 15 children of various ages and impairments. None of them attend school. In my letters home, I describe the children in ways which now make me cringe. And if, that, if you don't know that word in Swedish, it means, oh, I don't like to think that I use these words, okay? Freddy is a low-grade Mongol. Kleiner Claudia is a high-grade Mongol. And Edeltraut is a cabbage. That was a word I was used to in my home. Edeltraut is my age. She lies all day on her back in a cot, making occasional noises. She's very small. Her parents are among the very, very few parents who come to visit. She's clearly very loved. But I, as an 18-year-old, struggle to relate to Edeltraut as a human being. Especially when I'm putting on her nappy, pushing the feeding tube into her nose, or helping to administer her routine enemas which contained chamomile tea. Groups of visitors frequently come to see the good work of this home. It was considered good work. The director of the home asked them to gather around Edeltraut's cot. Now, as a member of the Hitler Youth, what a great moment to walk in. <laughs> Give me a chance to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> the director of the home, very tall German, speaking beautiful Hochdeutsch, he asked them all to gather around the cot. And he, he says, he makes a big speech about how wonderful the work is of this home, and it ends with, even Edeltraut has the right to life. He'd thrown a grenade into an old people's home as a member of the youth, Hitler Youth. He clearly was living out that story every day of his life in that home. And I realise now he's pl he planted that in me, although I still struggle with that, I have to say. Not the rights part, but you know, the, the life part, I suppose, the kind of life that Edeltraut was living. So in owning up in this very public way, to my own feelings of disgust when putting a nappy on Edeltraut and the difficulties in seeing her as fully human, I found no Martha Nussbaum's work really helpful. She's written about disability from a capability perspective and about the tendency of human beings to be repulsed by what we perceive as frailty in the impairment of others, especially bodily weakness. So she says it's possible to view another human being as a slimy slug or a piece of revolting trash only if one has never made a serious good faith attempt to see the world through that person's eyes or to experience that person's feelings. Disgust imputes to the other a subhuman nature. How by contrast do we ever become able to see one another as human? Only through the exercise of imagination. And she also says, it's through telling stories about the lives of others that we learn how to imagine what others might feel and this helps us to identify with the other and so learn something about ourselves. So I get to Manchester a year later, I'm, at, I'm 19, and I'm just going to run through a few of the, what I feel were uncomfortable stories planted in me on that four-year course. Deaf children can only learn one language. There's no such thing as sign language. And deaf children are no better than animals if they do not speak. Now next year, 
marks the 100th anniversary since teachers of the deaf were first trained in this building. Well, perhaps not in this building, but in this campus. A recent book documenting this history acknowledges the enormous shift in thinking that's taken place since those early days. When manual methods of communication were considered primitive and speech was considered the more highly evolved method of communication, a more sophisticated prop to thinking. Remember having to write an essay, Can Deaf Children Think? And the teacher's role was to deliver deaf children from silence and give them back their so long withheld God-given voices. Teaching children sign language risked pushing them back in the world's history to the infancy of our race. So this is a book that's online that's been published obviously recently, <coughs> reflecting back over this incredible history. Now this story may not still be taught in this building, but traces of this story live on in many educational institutions, certainly that I have visited around the world. And I think in this year's Academy Award winning film, I don't know if anyone's seen it, Silent Child, with its portrayal of a rural, lonely, white, middle-class deaf child who has no spoken or signed language, no hearing aids, no friends, and whose parents want her to speak, not sign. And that's in England. Sorry, I've... I want to go back one. So I just want to summarise there for you what I've been talking about so far. So these are the stories that I'm suggesting here were planted in me and that I chose to take on, I suppose, and I've chosen to argue quite a lot about <laughs> over my lifetime. Um, so I'm going to go leave you there to look at those. Now up to this point in my life, I've seen disabled people as mostly passive recipients of services. Christine was the first disabled person I got to know as an equal. I'd chosen to work in a middle school in Bradford where 10% of the children were deaf. It was way ahead of its time, the school. I had a class of 35 children, responsibility for the 10 deaf children spread across the year group. It was 1981, so it was the year that the Warnock Report was enacted. This school was pioneering inclusion before the word was ever used. Christine had been to Mary Hare Grammar School for the Deaf and was a committed oralist, in keeping with the school policy of no signing. She was a fantastic teacher who went on to be a primary school head teacher in Yorkshire. I occasionally went to the Deaf Club in town, Bradford, to learn some British Sign Language. And one evening I met Christine. She made me promise I would not tell anyone that she had been seen there. And she confessed to me that she was exhausted by the evening. All that lip reading all day, it was exhausting. She needed to sign to help her relax at night, but she did not want anyone to know she was doing it. Since then, I've had the enormous good fortune to have learned from disabled people in a wide range of cultural contexts, many of whom have changed history for the people, and the, including the disabled people in their countries. It's been the kind of learning that was not provided, and maybe was not possible to provide in my initial training. So I just want to say something a little about autoethnography. So I came upon the approach of autoethnography when I was doing my PhD. It was Madeleine Church who was then studying at Bath University with Jack Whitehead in his, set, his unit called Living Educational Theory Approach to Research and Life. It involved a lot of self-study. When I read Madeleine Church's uh, PhD about networking, it was a riveting read. I read it cover to cover, unlike anything I'd ever read at that point. And this led me to the work of Carolyn Ellis and others in the US. In a recent article, Carolyn Ellis has used the term autoethnographic life review, a phrase which kind of captures some of what I'm doing in this lecture. I find this quote really helpful in understanding why this approach is important. Scott Hoy had conducted a study in the South Pacific of the Ni Vanuatu people's reluctance to take simple preventative measures against eye disease. And here she describes why. She says, I had misrepresented the experience and betrayed the people. Writing the traditional ethnography, I seemed invisible, yet in absolute control. I had concerns about questions of identity and selfhood, voice, authenticity, and cultural displacement. I had learned from the Nivanuatu, not just about them. I was as much the taught as the teacher. That knowledge did not appear to be present in my first ethnography, because I was not present. 
I wanted to represent what I learned in a way that was appropriate for them. I turned to ethnography, a blend of ethnography and autobiographical writing that incorporates elements of one's li own life experience when writing about others. So to resume my story, in 1983, as I prepared to leave Bradford and move to Swaziland in Southern Africa to work in a residential school for the deaf, the only one in the country, I called into this building to see one of the lecturers. I just wanted to know, is there anything I should do to prepare myself before I go to Africa? That country, Africa. Forget everything we have ever taught you. Just make sure you love them, was what he said. Okay? Presumably, this was the single story to quote Chimamanda Agosi and Dichis. Adichie's wonderful TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story, that he had created about Africa, the stereotypical view of poor Africa that cannot sustain good quality educational practice with deaf children. I headed off to the continent with some basic knowledge of the language of Swaziland, Siswati, learnt from audio tapes, knowing that sign language existed but with no proficiency. And having been warned that South African spies were operating in the small town where I would be living. They were tough years, the 80s, in the struggle against apartheid and I was going to be living in one of the frontline states, directly affected by apartheid and the armed resistance to it. As my lecturer had suggested, there were many times when I considered my training irrelevant. Only two of the teenagers in my class of eight could speak, but they preferred not to. Teaching was in English. Home language was forbidden, so was sign language. The ch the, because deaf children can only learn one language. And they had no hearing aids. However, I had complete freedom to develop a pedagogy all of my own. No one questioned anything I did. But when I asked permission to enter my class into the final primary school state exam, I was told deaf children don't pass exams. Another story presumably planted and supported by the Irish nuns, I couldn't be sure, who set up the school and who trained in Manchester. Incidentally, I succeeded in getting that permission, and three passed and two came very close. These debates about what deaf children could and could not do were relatively straightforward compared to the moral, ethical and cultural dilemmas I faced in this school. I've been revi revisiting these dilemmas recently with Andy Howes through our work on photography as method in educational research. Andy talked about this approach when he did his Sarah Fielden lecture in March. It's through our deepening understanding of the way photographs position their readers and our development of a form of discourse analysis using images that I've engaged in an autoethnographic reflection on this particular photograph. I'm presenting you this photograph today to, to present the way that Andy and I are thinking about photography as method as well as to tell the next part of my story. Andy and I have argued in our writing that photographs are a visceral, bodily reminder of imbalances of power and the way this can be negotiated. And we do this in the context of what Mary Louise Pratt has called the contact zone. This account I'm going to read to you serves two purposes. It shows how I position myself in relation to the staff at the School for the Deaf and how I am positioned by this photo photograph. So this teenage girl is balancing on one leg, as you can see, could be a yoga pose, maybe harmless. But when I see this photograph, it's, it's less than now, because I've done so much study of it, but I, it, was, it was visceral reaction for me, seeing this photograph. This is a live punishment, routinely given for talking in class without the permission of the teacher, copying another student's work, lateness to school, or being rude. My response to this photograph doesn't relate to this girl at all. It relates to a memory of shock, powerlessness and suppressed rage when I inadvertently interrupted the beating of a deaf teenage girl in the head teacher's room in Swaziland. I'd been preparing lessons in my empty classroom. I heard this strange noise, a bit like the bleating of a lamb. And again, that's a sub, you know, non-human reference, but you know, it felt like that at the time. I followed the sound and then I saw what was happening. He was in the head teacher's room, Zanelli I'm going to call her, a girl from my class about 17 at the time, was lying face down on the floor, 
unable to read her environment, obviously because she's deaf, being beaten. The head teacher stopped when he saw me, looked very embarrassed. He must have thought I wasn't there that afternoon. He told me, and this is shocking, that she had been gang raped by male pupils and so had to be punished for her promiscuity. <coughs> now this photograph positions me as a young, very young, idealistic teacher negotiating a very uncomfortable role between the mostly female teachers who feared the headmaster, he was powerful, and the elderly Irish nuns. In my temporary role as foreign expert, I was determined not to impose my Western views, yet felt compelled to report the many injustices I witnessed to government officials. Awareness of teacher cruelty, potential abuse in schools, especially residential schools, and the failure of adults to protect vulnerable children have been ongoing concerns in my work ever since. There is a bigger concern here too about the male hegemonic forces which enables some men to remain in positions of leadership despite ample evidence of incompetence and cruelty, thus perpetuating cycles of injustice and oppression. So I'm getting to the main point now. We've had half an hour of story, ever so slightly behind time. What do I mean? I'm taking a big leap here. What do I mean by inclusion? Because I imagine there is a, as, many pe as many definitions of inclusion and inclusive education as there are people in this room. I, at first, when I prepared this lecture, I had several different competing definitions. And I thought, no, I'm going to go with Michelin Mason. Michelin says, inclusion is not a definable state, but a set of principles which can be applied to anything. It's not essentially about disability, but about building a sustainable future for all of us. Inclusion is an imagined future based on a worldview which could be called ecological, in which our interdependence is truly understood. Michelin was born in 1950. There's quite a 50s theme going here today. She was educated at first at home and then in a Catholic special school, a bit of a Catholic theme going too, where the nuns encouraged her to pray for a cure for her legs. In her book, Incurably Human, she says that she was certain, even at that age in school, that she already was human. Despite the nuns' efforts to convince her otherwise, she uses this experience to assert that all humans are incurable at our core. And that the inclusion movement is this inextinguishable flame made visible. <coughs> now, Michelin's definition of inclusion is for me as close as it's possible to get, possibly in the West, to the concept of Ubuntu. A lot of you may know already about Ubuntu. Desmond Tutu has popularized this term. It, I'm sure that Felix from Rwanda could tell us a lot more about it. Um, very simply s translated, it's one word, but it has a host of meanings. My humanity is inextricably bound up in yours. And I'm only a person through other per persons. Now, the, although a pan-African concept, um, Michelin had, that, had grasped that, I feel, in her definition of inclusion. I'm going to miss a little bit of this. Sean Gretsch has argued in, his, well, in various of his writings, but he also uh, edits Disability in the Global South, a very new open access journal, that the disproportionate emphasis placed on the rights of individuals in the inclusive education rhetoric can threaten long-established social systems and collectivist ways of being on which family and community, stability and solidarity rely in contexts of chronic poverty. So he's pointing to this, this disconnect, in a way, between the individual and the collectivist. In an article about the implications of Ubuntu for an African model of disability, Maria Bergs has talked about both Ubuntu and Umaka. Apparently Umaka is the, the environmental equivalent, where's Rachel, of, of, um, of Ubuntu. Okay. So it's, I can't summarise the article, but it's a really exciting article which talks about the interdependence, not just between people, but with, between, with the environment. And that she's kind of pointing to this African <coughs> model of disability that could actually pre 
bring something really <laughs> enlightened and progressive to those of us rather stuck, perhaps, in what we mean by inclusion here. So this brings me to um, my work in ENET, the Enabling Education Network, which we, Miguel explained, this is what brought me back to this building after all those years. After 12 years, I went for two and came back after 12. Um, and the, we were acutely conscious of all these tensions, you know, this sort of global south, global north tensions. We were super conscious of the kind of language we use when we set up ENET. The newsletter was, has been produced every year since 1997 when we set it up. It's still being produced, so it's more than 21 years it's been going. Almost all the funding came from Nor Norway. We started with slow mail. I sent my first email and set up a website not understanding what on earth that was. And our, our claim was, our, our aim was sort of opposite to academia in a way. It was about getting the, the most basic and most clear, accessible information to the people who most needed it in countries with the least material resources in the Global South. Now, because we are in a university, I did a PhD. <laughs> and I created in my PhD um, a, a theory of inclusive networking. So I, I did a lot of reading and it was based on my, my own experience. So I, auto, auto ethnographically I studied the experience of, in, of those 12 years in Africa, the experience of setting up ENET um, and came up with this <coughs> kind of theory, which I haven't done a great deal with actually since I have to confess. However, the, my, the writing that I've engaged in has been very focused on networking and the power and potential of networking, which I think is greatly overlooked. Now this is how I like to think of networks. This is from a Bangladeshi artist of the Bangladeshi wires in a Dakar street. It's very, very complicated. Um, so I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit because I, I want to get to the, the, the Global South. We're kind of dipping in and out here with all sorts of references. This list here was presented to us at an away day at the beginning of this month by uh, Professor Leach. This was a list that he presented from the 1990s that he created of this is how the press portray educational research in the UK. <laughs> and I'm just using it here because I think it contains the seeds of or even the essence of what we're dealing with possibly in research in the Global South. Lack of rigour, failure to produce cumulative research findings, theoretical incoherence, ideological bias for sure, and I am guilty of that myself, irrelevance to schools, lack of involvement of teachers, inaccessibility and poor dissemination, poor cost effectiveness. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, that's not too many years behind, I mean that we were behind <laughs> in this country, given what I'm going to present of what's happening now in the Global South. So. The latest statistic, there are 264 million children and youth not going to school. Okay. That's now counting primary and secondary age. In the 1990s, when the whole Education for All movement started globally, there was only the counting of primary age children. So there were 160 million children out of school in, in 1990, but now there are 264 million in, in 2018. But that's because now there's an effort to get children into secondary. Those of you who've seen the, the seed video, you might have seen or heard my voice saying at least 250 million children globally have failed to acquire basic literacy skills despite having spent four years in school. Now, that was a, a soundbite that you can imagine the donor community latched onto quite strongly. There's been a great expansion of low cost private schools as a result, I think, of, of that sort of approach. And it's actually a 10-year-old old statistic. It takes five years at least to collate statistics in, in across, because we're saying the Global South, and this is the majority of the world we're talking about. It takes a lot of time and effort, especially in context of, con of conflict. So, Jeffrey Sachs, who's written a lot about poverty in his, uh, his uh, introduction to the 2006 Global Education Monitoring <coughs> Report, these are reports that you can get off UNESCO's website every year, phenomenal amount of statistics summarising progress towards education for all, 
um, that there simply ha is a lack of investment. It's not actually going to be possible. And he's arguing that it's da the investment is down now than from what it used to be. But he also makes claims that this is world peace we're talking about. This is important. Uh, but it's, it's possibly being neglected. And the other issue which I f worry about greatly is, is this thing about surveillance. Um, so we, we've got a whole sets of international targets and monitoring. And thanks to technology, we can do that more efficiently and effectively. So these poor countries who are being surveilled, <laughs> have, you know, they have to produce a lot of data to, to evidence to the donors what they are doing in their education system. In 1990, it was about literally bums on seats, how many children in the schools. Now it's much more a uh, complex set of measures and indicators to, to assess how effective those measures are. So my namesake, not, not a relative, Mike Miles, emailed me this week with his latest contribution. For 40 years has been commentating on this situation. Um, and he's arguing in this piece, I'm not going to read it, that uh, here, I'm going to use here because I know England better than I know Europe, but I, I know a little bit about Europe. It's taken us a long time to get where we are. Think about where my parents were with that wedding in 1955. Food rationing, post-war Britain. Um, clever spastics in a residential school in Glossop um, and so on. So, and we've made mistakes and he's arguing about there's a funny, you know, a great mixture of idealism, realism, resources and knowledge and, and nobody's been watching us or measuring us. We've measured ourselves, of course. But by contrast, economically weaker countries have a plethora of modern knowledge and techniques and conflicting advice. Mel Aisko often says, we know how to do this thing called inclusive education, we just don't have the will. So the knowledge is there. Um, there are ser serious material things lacking, of course, um, and, and the lack of space, time and freedom to make mistakes for themselves. So one of my concerns in my research, my writing, is and teaching, of course, is, is that the, the global goals, which... I could have presented in more detail, but I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the Sustainable Development Goals. They are big and bold and ambitious and inspiring, but they, in education they rely on ordinary primary school, secondary school teachers to make them happen in education. And yet, as um, that slide showed us, Professor Leach, 20 years ago or so in England, the, there was an irrelevance of research to schools, there was a lack of involvement of teachers in policy and practice, and the inaccessibility and poor dissemination of research findings, which is absolutely true of countries in the Global South, and my knowledge mostly extends to, is, is of Sub-Saharan Africa. So, thanks to Farfa, I have this wonderful map. I've had it for years, ever since I went to Australia on one occasion, I picked it up, upside down map. Um, so you'll see that Zambia is quite high up there, um, and I'm just going. Um, this is the beginning of just a smattering of accounts from three countries: Zambia, Tanzania, and Malaysia. So there's Zambia in the north of sub-Saharan Africa on this map, and there it is in more detail. I many years ago, Mel Ainsco and I. Um, ran and led an, an action learning project, we called it, in Zambia and Tanzania for several years. It was in my ENET days, and it was pivotal to our work, and it helped us to, th to think through how were we going to engage with southern contexts, capture evidence and innovative examples, and get them shared between southern contexts in, in effective ways. One of the things that we did was to ask teachers to, to write stories. This story is a composite account constructed by the Zambian researcher, myself, and is based on the writing of the actual teacher. <coughs> Anton, this child, a uh, um, pseudonym of course, is, has albinism, so he lacks pigment in his skin, and he's attending school for the first time. The teacher's aim is to teach the pupils how to deal with the situation, but the lesson doesn't go well. Children are scared, they run away, 
the teacher takes the children outside and she acknowledges in her story that she's written that she feared Anton. She, she didn't want to catch this thing called albinism. And in her upbringing, she'd been told the story, you, if you see an albino, you have to spit saliva on your chest and then you'll be safe. You won't catch it. And she didn't want to show the pupils that she wasn't happy. She was in this fabulous school that was really pushing the boundaries in terms of inclusion and democracy and child rights. And suddenly she was faced with the reality of her own discrimination. There's Anton, a photograph taken when Mel Ainsco visited the classroom. Uh, he's well integrated into that class, but doesn't have anything particularly special. There's no glasses in remote parts of the Global South. It, there were glasses on children in 1955 in Glossop, but it's very, very hard to get the basic assistive devices that would be needed to have a fully participating and achieving experience of school. So now moving to Tanzania. In 2010, this study took place that I'm going to talk about ever so briefly. And it's, what I'm going to share with you is based on an article that I've written with colleagues in Sussex University, Joe Westbrook and Alison Croft. So they were part of this study. It was six countries in, in Africa, a really big budget, 1.5 million. Ghana, Mali and Senegal in West Africa, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda in East Africa. Now, as is the case with most educational research, there was no overt, overt focus on inclusion or disability equality. They were looking at reading, writing, literacy, numeracy. And they were looking at newly qualified teachers, uh, trainee teachers and experienced teachers. What they noticed when they started to look at the data was that the Tanzanian teachers seemed to be really competent and confident in dealing in their day-to-day -day life with disabled children and it stood out from the data. The other teachers didn't mention anything about that in their accounts. It's not a surprise that Tanzania is like this. The, the, the leader of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, was known as Mwalimu, which is the Swahili word for teacher. He had a massive impact on the education system. And, and it seems from their data that this is continuing. Sorry, I forgot to press the extra. <laughs> so this is, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to share lots of data, but this was just one. So out of 88 experienced teachers in the Tanzanian study, one had been on a training course in inclusive education. There is no real training in inclusive education anywhere on the continent of sub-Saharan Africa, according to a recent report. So it's all special, or it's mainstream. And which, you know, anyway, that's how it is. So she's reporting that, you know, at first these children were a disturbance and, and she didn't know what to do, but after attending the seminar, interestingly, is what my lecturer told me in this building, we were told to love them. And so now she feels normal. And she's starting to get the fact that the environment of the child may affect his or her learning. Now, I don't have any pictures of the Tanzanian classrooms, but they're a little bit similar to the picture of Anton in his Zambian classroom. Not enough furniture, not enough books, and very packed with children. So getting across a classroom to help a child or to work in, in individually is almost impossible. But there's evidence in this data of incredible efforts being made by those teachers and considerable sensitivity to the challenge that they were facing with apparently no training. This is not a donor-funded project. These were, these were representative schools across Tanzania in many, many different uh, areas of Tanzania. And the classroom teachers talk confidently about children who were blind, who were visually impaired, had albinism, hearing impairments, or who were short and stunted through malnutrition. And those who were regarded as slow learners. So what we found when we kind of re-analyzed the data, obviously some years later, was there was considerable evidence of teacher autonomy, agency, reflective practice, especially the experienced teachers who'd had between 5 and 37 years of experience. These might seem incredibly simple as I, as I read them to you now. In, they seem basic, don't they? But it's not evident that that's happening in, in other countries necessarily, but it, it was certainly happening here. 
without any particular outside influence, although presumably the teachers are tuning in to this global conversation stimulated by United Nations and so on, but not with any direct uh, experience of that themselves. So we're moving to Southeast Asia, and I'm rather cheekily talking about Farfa's research. Farfa's my PhD student. She's a teacher of the deaf from Malaysia. And if I press that, you can see a little bit better where Malaysia is and how it's next to Borneo. And Wendy McCracken on the front row here is the co-supervisor for Farfa. Now, I've not done this before, talk about middle income countries. I mean, this is a terribly economist view of the world, isn't it? To divide countries between low, middle and high income countries anyway. But Malaysia is an aspirational middle income country. They don't have classrooms like, well, maybe they do, and maybe you know, not many people go there in the rural areas. But the area of Malaysia where, where Fafa has been doing her research is, is quite urban, quite highly developed. Um, and it's groundbreaking what she's done. So she, she interviewed over 30 stakeholders in three primary schools, looking at the inclusion of deaf children. She has seven deaf children and two deaf adults in, in her study. Now, the international literature on the experiences of deaf children in mainstream education in the Global South is virtually non-existent. So, what Farfa has done is a really, really important contribution. So, just to tune you in, there is a strong British theme here in the context. The model of special education is evident. Most children are in units, still called units, but they're actually gated communities separate from the mainstream school, physically in the same location, and 40% and are in special schools for the deaf. Now, Fafa was sent by the government to come here, Manchester, to me, <laughs> to find out how to do this thing called inclusion for deaf children, because I guess they think it might be quite straightforward. You just need to send one person to Manchester and they'll go back and it will all happen. Now, what Farfa has discovered on a truly, truly memorable journey, <laughs> quite a, a steep learning curve and expanding her world in many, many ways, is that, that you know, that's simply not going to happen in that simple a way. So this is a very quick look at the, the summary of her findings. Um, Surprise, surprise, in a way, some of this. There are 600 plus children with cochlear implants that are, you know, that quite a sophisticated operation, really requiring long term support, professional help, highly, highly specialized help for them to be truly effective. Um, and a, a kind of lack, lack of knowledge, in a way, in the education system. So the health system is generating these children with cochlear implants, but then there isn't really a connection to the education system to know how, well, then what happens, sort of thing. Um, however, there, there are some phenomenal parents, just in your one study, a couple of parents who are really going for it. And I think in at least ten, less than 10 years, there will be a very powerful parents organization fighting for those rights and negotiating these disconnects between health and education. And what Fafa keeps reminding Wendy and I is that uh, for the first time ever, deaf children are speaking. That's never happened before in Malaysia. And that is a sort of small miracle that people make assumptions, of course, oh, right, well, we can include them now. And of course, it's not so straightforward. But, but it is changing how, how the issue is being treated by the government. <coughs> So that was a whistle-stop tour through three locations. Sorry to go so fast at the end there. I was being very self-indulgent about my story at the beginning. And it's impossible to conclude, and in a way I'm not concluding really. I'm just, I, I'm looking forward to the conversation <coughs> afterwards. But I've, I've heard Mel Ainsco say this term for years and years and years, inclusion is a, soci um, a social process. And I just want to add the words messy, non-linear and complex to that. Um, highly complex <laughs> and often poorly understood and I would say it's about all about power and relationships it's not not as much about braille and sign language and in some contexts it's about contexts it is I think in my experience it's about what it means to be recognized as fully human 
And I'm also suggesting that stories have the potential to empower and humanise. They could also have the, the option of disempowering and dehumanising, which is what we get through the media so much of the time. And I just want to finish with Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. If you haven't read her work, please do. The Danger of the Single Story, this is from her TED Talk. She finishes on this note. When we reject the single story, we regain a kind of paradise. Thank you. Thank Questions? You. Thank you very much, Susie. Wow. Um, we'll take questions now. I forgot to make the reference to the cockroaches. I wanted to... I had, there's quite a bit that I skipped out. I'd timed it, like Ruth told me to. Um, and I thought I was going to manage it, but I missed quite a few things out, and I wanted to make the reference to the Rwandan genocide, where through the media one group of people were told the other group of people were cockroaches and they must be killed. It's the most perfect example. I mean, it was horrific and a million people died in 10 days. Uh, and that happened in classrooms and education helped that to happen. And, you know, it, this is not, that's so long ago. And also the language, I mean, not to make, you know, language is complex and I don't speak Kenya Rwanda, but I've, re I've written an article with a, a Rwandan professor who taught Felix, who's in the audience, and, and we've written about the, the grammar of, Ru of Kenya Rwanda, which means that disabled people are referred to as objects and not people. So the language is functioning as a way of, de of dehumanizing. And I'm not saying that our language is necessarily superior <laughs> to that. It's just, it's still language. It's language that we have to wrestle with all the time. It's complex. Yeah. Sorry, no, I took over again. Any questions or comments for Susie? Mm -hmm. um, Alex. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's very stimulating. I'm interested to know your thoughts on just how much we can use this idea of uh, or the understanding of the psychology of dehumanization mm -hmm. and dementalization as a framework for understanding how inclusive structures mm. are or exclusive. Mm. Well, this lecture kind of evolved and I don't have the answer to that. I've not read those books, yeah, but, but I suspect there's something to do to, to take that forward as a, as a theme in a way, as a way of challenging. Right. I think because I think things have got a bit stuck. That's my experience anyway, but you know, we think we we're a bit complacent, really, about, I guess, about... Because inclusion, for me, is about being vigilant to threats to equity that could happen tomorrow or the next minute. Not, not something fixed and that we put it in place. We've implemented and we've done it. So sending Farfa back to Malaysia isn't going to change anything at all. No, no disrespect to, to Farfa. But, but there will be all sorts of threats <laughs> jumping up all the time that she can't manage on her own. Um, and so it may be that the help, I don't know, that's a new project maybe. Maybe we could work together on it. So I'm, not, I'm dodging your question, can you tell? <laughs> Anybody got an answer to the question? Erica? Well, maybe I can sort of add to Alex's question. Hi, Alex. Um, you know, you know, in a way, I suppose that, you know, this term inclusion is very used in lots of contexts and in this country, it was the sort of uh, a key a key word in the the Blair administration. Mm. Kind of mm -hmm. bold, wasn't it? Mm. That social um, and there there the problem with the term inclusion, which is not the not the way in which you're using it, but it might help to explicate some of the mm. problems, mm. is that uh, the demand was for for people to be for everyone to be included in a way that didn't allow allow mm. us mm. to problematise what it was we were being included into. Yes, yes. Rather yeah. than, you know, the, the Absolutely. social yeah. exclusion, yeah. that people were excluded yeah. weren't included and they had to be included. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it was so done to them rather than... Well, not only done to them, but the idea that, that uh, what, you know, what had to be done was to include people mm. end of story mm. rather than mm. problematise mm. the, the nature of, the, of, of, of what people were being included into. Mm. Mm. And I suppose that's where you have the tensions 
in disability movements oh, definitely. about affirmations of difference mm. and mm. refusals mm. to conform mm. to or assimilate into certain kinds yeah. of Yeah, and movements. between deaf the deaf movement and the disability movement, there's an enormous amount of tension, yeah. yeah. The tensions are everywhere. And, and the same with the kind of f fully human when the definition of humanity is so, has been historically so aligned with colonial yeah. and, and, mm. and mm. you know, androcentric and mm. patriarchal mm. and mm. gender normative mm. yeah, 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 yeah. models that, that demand us to reconfigure yeah. and develop another kind of language, I suppose, yes. around yeah. That, but the kind of so so that's where the definitions that you an analysis you gave earlier about you know from through Ubuntu and other, mm. other kind of mobilisation of mm. other cultural resources to think about interdependency in relationships, mm. um, you know, and 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 in what you just said then about inequalities. Mm. Mm. So thank you, thank you. I wonder. We today it's unusual. We have thirty people from Sweden, who who Samira has brought. <laughs> Are there any specific questions? That anybody from? Feel free if you have anything. I learned so much from meeting your colleagues in the past when Samira has brought you over. So different culture altogether. No. Trans with translation, maybe. No. Anyway. Sue. So. It's quite a prosaic question, really, but when you're talking, thinking about the, the British education system, English education system, um, and I kind of feel it's gone quiet, the kind of movement for you know, the separation between mainstream and special schools and inclusive movement. I think it has gone quiet, yeah. I'm not as in touch with what's going on in the UK as I should be. So you probably know that better, Sue, because you're in and out of schools. But has the inclusion movement gone quiet? I think it probably has, actually. And you're saying yes. So yes, I. And I was with a, a blind activist from India over the weekend, and he's working at a, a global level. But he he's feeling the same about at global level too. There's a sort of staleness in a way about those discussions and debates at the moment, and assumptions being made that aren't very helpful. So. So I guess, I mean, the, the bottom line in a highly developed country, so-called, is um, resourcing, isn't it? And so the, the, the whole special educational needs, so-called, or sender uh, and disability is, is attached to, to resource. I don't know, I'm not well qualified to talk about this, but I think that it, it's a bit of a battleground about the individual, very often the individual parent, um, which is what Farfa found in Malaysia. You know, there were individual parents just going to do what they wanted that for their child, and they were going to make sure that child, their child got that. Um, so that's back to that whole individual collective type tension, I suppose, yeah. Yes, Samira. Um, just looking at the disability aspect um, in the UK, I think there is a need to enlighten the dialogue about it because I think there is a presumption because you're in the West that like you're ahead of the game because you may be slightly ahead of another part of the world mm. but yet yeah. there's far more to do in the aspect of mm. social equality and social justice for groups of mm. um, individuals who may not be able to interact with the world as the perceived norm mm. as everybody mm. else mm. So I think as equally as we reflect on parts of the world that are not as developed but are keen to develop like Farfa is mm. doing at the moment in Malaysia, there is so much more that we can be doing in the UK yeah, to too. ensure that we keep mm. momentum mm. because as long as it stays quiet, it's not that it's achieved. Mm. It's the fact it's mm. not fully forgotten. Uh, you've reminded me, I had a phone call last week from somebody in the Home Office, actually, it's a friend who studied here and then she worked for the Dif Department for International Development, and she'd had a distress call from the person in charge of disability at di the Department for International Development. They're the government, our government, is organising a big disability conference in June. I'd never, I hadn't, I've obviously dropped off the mailing list, I hadn't heard about it. But the person managing this is quite inexperienced in this issue. And they had been told that the British disability movement was going to be protesting outside every day during this conference taking place in June. Uh, protesting, I mean, th th we have this discussion in Norway quite a lot about, oh, it's, uh, you know, we shouldn't be wasting our money <laughs> over there. Um, and not seeing any interconnections either 
Um, and so th this person, in fact, I haven't phoned this. I promised I would, I would phone somebody up and give, give them some help to negotiate this tension, which is real, you know, and it's, 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 it's strong. Um, and a lot of misunderstandings in the process, yeah, this artificial global north and south divide, yeah. And disability surely, well, I don't know, I often think the Paralympics for me is an example of, of how massive the divide is. I often look at the Paralympics, no, I don't often look. When I have watched the Paralympics, I'm kind of analysing it from a sort of geopolitical war perspective and thinking about which countries are represented and how many and what kind. You know. But, you know, there's a phenomenal imbalance, but at the same time, a lot hasn't changed. Is what kind of what I feel I found in the I'm mud. Well, yes, Mel often says we're back in the 70s. But you know, that's human. That's what it's about, isn't it? We're kind of <laughs> evolving or just not learning and having to relearn. Yeah. Anyway, we should let people go. Yeah, we still have a question. Yes, you're on the first time. You and then Ruth. I mean, this is this is not my area, but sometimes I feel the, the the word inclusion and what it means is to me it comes across as a bit instrumental. You know, the instrumental inclusion of people like you know, yeah, yeah, very like Erica said. Observable things. Yeah. And then we wrap it up in postmodern language. <laughs> and then still stuck with this instrumental kind of challenge. <laughs> Uh, I think when you use the word human and other human or what is it to be human, to me that's the key to maybe taking the next step. Mm. Mm. And there needs to be a next step. Mm. Mm. I'm very excited about the whole Ubuntu. I mean, I know that it's a bit of a cliche now, but you know, there's potential, isn't there? Because the Sustainable Development Goals is about our planet. It's about all of us. And whether, whatever you think of them and however, whether they're a bit softer or not very effective, nobody's taking any notice. They're still there and they're still an instrument. And it brings us back into relationship with everybody and everything living. Yeah. So I didn't answer your question. I don't know if it was a question, you. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ruth. Yeah. Hello, Ruth. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about what happened in Tanzania? Why yeah, you go saw back a different to sort of set of practices and you know okay. understandings there that you didn't see in other places? Well, I wasn't in Tanzania, my colleagues in Sussex were, and they'd been telling me about this data for ages and ages and ages. They hadn't had time to write it up. Um, they'd done one paper already about the, the newly qualified teachers, and they noticed a big difference in the newly qualified teachers and the experienced teachers. Um, they didn't have a, a reason, they couldn't identify why all those other countries had not, you know, there was no evidence of any discussion about diversity among learners you know that it just wasn't in the conversation now that could have been because it was funded by the floor what's it, hewlett packard foundation um and you know maybe they i don't know i don't know about the politics of the study um but it, if you're interested in tanzania uh, is that what it, tanzania as an entity or what was actually happening in those classrooms so what, what, yeah so what i've heard uh, you talk an awful lot about why things change or, or don't change in countries. Um, okay. I, I wonder if you, you have an insight into why things seem to be different there. Well, we had a wonderful colleague here called Joseph Kisanji, who some of us will remember, and I, I skipped over a quote from Joseph Kisanji. Uh, just because I looked at the, the clock and thought, help, I'm not going to be able to fit that in. Um, and he helped us set up ENET, he was our critical friend, wasn't he? Do you remember Andy all those years ago? He was Tanzanian and he hadn't gone to school until he was 10. He had a visual impairment from having mumps. His grandmother kept him at home to keep him safe. I'm not going to be able to find it, am I? Um, and he, so he had an experience of being visually impaired and not going to school. He he then, so as a result, he experienced what was called customary education. Now, this is all over Africa, in my understanding, or it was in the idealised version of what Africa might have been, um, uh, the intact Africa. Um, and he, um, and then he went to school, and then he got a PhD in Manchester <laughs> about deafness, <laughs> and he was part of the whole Enet thing. And he, but then he he, he wrote a lot of. Um, not going to find it. Um, 
he wrote a lot, he did a lot of research in Tanzania about proverbs. He, he was determined to put forward a, a, a global south perspective on traditional attitudes to disability, which kind of links into the Ubuntu thing, which I would say is what is Africa wide. But he, you know, he'd argue that cu customary education, as he called it, traditional um, education, which is what the elders provided the children, is what happens in indigenous, indigenous communities. So some of those 63 million children who aren't in school yet, maybe it's better that some of them aren't ever <laughs> in school, you know, because our planet might not survive because they have that indigenous knowledge of those plants and those rivers and, the, and so on and so on. And that's been passed down from the elders to the children in, in very natural ways, in practical natural ways. And to take them out of that into some formal classroom where they sit bored all day, writing a language they don't understand, you know, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm suddenly getting carried away. Mm -hmm. But um, so he, he had personally experienced that. And he's written a chapter in a book about be growing up disabled in, the, in Tanzania. Um, and so he could sort of see it from both sides. And of course, he would have been born just before or just about the independence time. So he experienced probably the the best of colonial education, you know, in terms of standards and, and you know, <coughs> things not deteriorating as much as they have, because Tanzania in the late 80s, 90s was hit hard by IMF and, mm -hmm. you know, cut spending cuts and, and that neo ne neoliberal thing was harsh on Tanzania. But somehow deep down, what, the, what Joe and Alison feel that they've found is that, that real deep, deep commitment to education as a value, which a lot of the other African leaders maybe so don't from, have. From the Julius Nyerere, he wrote a huge amount about, about the value of education, about, and it was about being, he talks about in his writings. You know, it's, it's not about filling children with knowledge, <laughs> it's about how a teacher is being. You know? so, so they think that there's, there's that really strong connection. So in 1969 <coughs> in Tanzania, they were already pr pioneering inclusive education. It wasn't called that. Meanwhile, my Robert in my class was <coughs> illegally in my class, you know, <laughs> so they, they were kind of ahead really in Tanzania and they don't get that recognition because the story apparently starts in 1990 in John Tien in Thailand at a, at a UNESCO conference on education for all, you know, but actually Tanzania was doing it in the 70s, but then they got crippled by all that international debt and so on. So, so it's complicated and I've never, well I have been to Tanzania quite often, I went to Zanzibar, you know Tanzania as well, don't you? Yeah, but I don't, you know, I don't, I can't make any claim. So, yeah, scattered knowledge, ideological bias. We have time for just one round of uh, questions. Anyone? A whole round. <laughs> well, I, I have, it's mine plus another. Anyone else wants that? <laughs> Can I say this quickly enough, I wonder? Do you think perhaps the inclusion issue in the, of special school and inclusion in ordinary mainstream schools has got a bit quiet because we reached a point 20 years ago or so where children who, when they were included, this is just a few children, but when they were included in mainstream school, mm. at enormous battles from parents, I mean, I was talking of Sheffield, that's the only mm. place I know, enormous battles, mm. but the children who occasionally then in the sixth form would turn up back in, um, you know, I would come across sometimes in one of the special schools, but they would have been there without understanding mm, language. Mm, mm, they would have mm, been deprived mm, of mm, the sensory diet mm. and the, a very different sort of inclusion. So it was called in inclusion. Special schools. It was called it inclusion, was called but actually... Inclusion, yeah. but actually for some children it was a deprivation. Mm. I mean, we've and come a long way from when a child who I knew very well, she was like a friend rather than anything else. I used to make her a few hand splints on the side at home, but she was actually in a school for disabled children in Sheffield um, when she got too heavy for the head teacher at mm. her primary mm. school to carry her around. Mm. She was reading beautifully at six, and there she was in a school Stuck in a for school. disabled so children. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I mean, she died when she was 12, but prior yeah. to that, yeah. she'd actually been in a mainstream mm. school. Which Hope should have been giving is. this lecture. Hope was in Swaziland <laughs> before I was. She was an occupational therapist in the hospital that I worked in, and she's come all the way from Sheffield to be here. But we did so have an inclusion discussion a long time ago. We have, you, yeah. You know, my position of so much ignorance of what I've heard today, but also just the practicality. Yeah, the children it's huge. Children having their it's huge. needs met, it's huge. Mm. Huge. and parents' wants, changing that little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's huge. Mm.
but you know I could I could tell you some phenomenal stories where you know what might seem impossible has happened in a in a remote rural area of Lesotho for example and that's changed the whole community just by making the effort for that very severely disabled child to go to school you know they've got a new road that the community's built as a result and you know there are all sorts of yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of, and I don't want to go on about individual examples, but yeah, yeah. So, but it, I don't think it's ever going to be, we're not going to arrive in this paradise, are we? I don't think. But, but the paradise of not seeing people as a single story would be great to achieve. Yeah. It's a balance. There's a balance. Yeah. It's yeah. finding yeah. its level yeah. possibly a little bit. Yeah, moment by moment. So, if, you, if I may, just so that on, on this last point, um, maybe to close. Um, you, you, I think, used very well autoethnography if you explained um, that kind of framing for, for mm. your lecture today. Mm. Uh, and as you work at a university now, and as several of us are actually involved in higher education, can you just tell us a little bit of that reflection of inclusive education in the higher education context? So, for instance, here at the place where you study. Do you know, I was going to finish with that. I, have, I was rushing to finish. Things or what can, you, what can you say, perhaps, Must have inclusive skipped. education, but in, in the context that most of, of us find right. ourselves in? I had a really great paragraph that I was going to finish on about <laughs> higher education, <laughs> and I can't find it. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> Must have deleted it this morning. Um, but it was in the Athena Swan, which is a weird, you know, Athena is a goddess of truth and endeavour and things like that. And then SWAN is Scientific Women's Academic Network. This is a British thing to promote equality in higher education. And we've just got the Bronze Award, so we've just made a f the first start. But it is actually about creating an inclusive culture. That's, it's written in the charter. Um, and I, I, it is also accused of being a, a box-ticking exercise in a lot of contexts. Um, and so I suppose... W I think where, you, well, where I want to take my answer anyway is about how we can use that as a mechanism to ask a lot of questions about what's happening in higher education to actually pursue this sort of conversation rather than the box ticking exercise or are, are the right numbers of people, men and women attending promotion workshops or whatever it is, you know. Um, so, so I think there's a big job to be done here on inclusive education, yeah. but that. D I don't think I've quite got time to answer that. We should have that conversation another time. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank, Thank you. you.